so introduction to Irigaray. <laughs> Uh, before I do that, let me just talk a little bit about your essays um, that I've read so far. <laughs> um, I was just about to get into grading the late papers, so I've started that already. Um, but in general, for, um, for Sangor, what a lot of you are not doing, <laughs> so those who haven't done it yet, listen up, <laughs> is arguing for what these guys are saying. Don't go tell me Sangor believes, Sangor believes, and then I'm going to accept that, right? No, it's not. This is not high school, right? <laughs> you need to actually um, show their argument, right? How are they arguing for what they're saying in a convincing way, right? So you need to draw on what they where they go to to argue right Senghor of course goes to Chardin right so inevitably right when you're talking about Senghor you got to bring that up because that's his, the basis of his argument uh, and Shati of course is um, also making certain arguments based on uh, the concept of seriti or physics <laughs> right so don't just tell me what they believe right this is not this is not high school where you're just writing a <laughs> some, you know, what do you call them, those papers, right? <laughs> so you need to actually always, anytime you say anything, right? Anytime you're bringing up a philosopher's viewpoint, you have to also bring up their argument, right? Um, so a, a lot of you, actually most of you that I read so far, just telling me what Senghor believes is not going to convince me. <laughs> Remember, these essays, you want to be, um, always think when you're writing these essays that you're writing for someone who disagrees with you, right? How would you convince them, right? You're, you're, when you write in general, right? You're always writing to someone. You're not writing to me. <laughs> you're writing to someone who you know might disagree with you. How would you best convince them, right? If you're going to dismantle the American dream with Levinas, fine. But um, you're talking to someone who believes in the American dream, right? And so how would you convince them? So always when you're writing, you're thinking, how can I convince someone who disagrees with me? What kind of argument must I pull from the philosopher in order to do so. Does that make sense? Any questions on the essay so far? Okay, good. So uh, in general, right? So including with Irigaray, you need to continue to, uh, and those who haven't done Shati yet, of course, you need to, uh, to uh, make sure you're arguing, showing their argument, right? Okay, good. Um, one more thing. Some of you are panicking um, about your grades. Um, I really wouldn't panic because, um, you know, I'm calculating, even if you get a C on all the tests, um, you know, the, the worst can happen to you is a B. So, <laughs> right. So I've set up the class. So, um, you just get a little bit of an electric shock, but not a big, you know, um, <laughs> you know, with a nine, you get a little bit of electric shock, but it's not going to affect your future, right? <laughs> this is COVID times. I was asked to be lenient. So I'm being lenient. So you get a little electric shock, right? Ah, I have a nine. I'm, I, I'm a sucker. Right? <laughs> but at the same time, you know, it's not going to destroy your life because the worst you can get with a nine, 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 uh, if you're consistent in the other work, right, is a B. Uh, you might even pull off an A. I calculated last night in my bed. I was thinking of you guys. <laughs> I calculated. You can get a, a nine, like how many times? How many tests? We have five, right? So that's like um, three times five. No, it does. Uh, yeah. Because with the two extra credit assignments plus the two bonus points, if you have a perfect record, you can even pull off an A, <laughs> right? So don't get too stressed about your grade. Just use your grade as an opportunity to better yourself, right? This is just an indication, okay, here's where I can get better. It's like, uh, it's an incentive for you to get better. It's not something that's going to destroy your life, right? Um, I've made it on purpose because I know everybody's stressed and depressed. Uh, and I think half the class is stressed and depressed because I'm never getting a uh, test on time. <laughs> like a third, a fourth, a fourth of you are functioning right now. I realize that. That's fine. I'm stressed and depressed too. So, <laughs> so don't worry. So that's why the grading system I have is really not going to sink you. It's, it's, it's it actually with C average in the test, which is the worst grade I give, actually, to be honest. If you do it below, I make you redo it. So, 
So you cannot go below C and then you can still pull off a B, even an A if you're very, very um, uh, skillful. Okay, any questions or worries that I need to address? <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah, just to say, you know, in general, I have to say, for the most part, I think 90% of the time, I'm actually enjoying your essays, <laughs> right? So actually enjoying your stuff and your, your views and the way you're working, right, through the material, very pleasant for me to read your essays, right? So that's a good sign. <laughs> that shows that you guys are actually doing intelligent work. Maybe your writing needs a bit of, you know, um, whatever help but you're in uh, as far as the content to be honest 90 percent of the time i'm really enjoying it like it's a relaxing time for me to read your essays i'm like oh that's a good idea oh i hadn't thought of it that way this is interesting so as a class to be honest i'm really enjoying you so the the grades are mostly reflecting your writing which you should expect <laughs> i don't want to like you know criminalize you for being in Queens College, but as a whole, Queens College students don't know how to write. So this is a general thing, right? Which, um, which is now you have an opportunity to fix, right? To try to fix if you want to. Okay, great. I think I saw a question in the chat. Um, am I going to have to read your test? Paris, did you get a grade? Um, when it, talk to me after class. I don't, I don't remember telling you to redo your test. Um, so we'll talk after class. Okay, yeah, if any of you, by the way, today I have a little time, right? So if I don't have my next class, so if any of you want to talk about past tests, you want to discuss why you keep on getting the same grade, <laughs> right? Or you want to talk about your life and why you're depressed, you can do all that. I have some time after class today. Uh, good, all right, now let's go into Iri Garay. So introduction to Iri Garay. Finally, we have woman philosopher. That's the ultimate other for some of you. <laughs> For the men in the class, we're going to talk now about the ultimate other. <laughs> you will finally start to get a slight insight into what's going on in our heads. So this should be exciting for you. Um, you know, I always think that we shouldn't teach women philosophers in a feminism class. And the reason I think that is that when you see the word feminism philosophy, feminist philosophy, men flee <laughs> and the women flock, when in fact, most of these writers are writing to men. So it's a quite big tragedy that all of these writers who are trying to reach the men are being taught in feminist philosophy classes, which cause this kind of, what do you call it, um, male flight, <laughs> just to see the title, right? So I have to uh, confess that I'm thinking of teaching feminism, but undercover. So I'm gonna have like a different title and no one will know. And then there will be all these males in the class. and. <laughs> So beware in the future if you see me teaching a class that's vague, probably. <laughs> so anyway, so we're going to be dealing today with a feminist, which is not actually one of the most aggressive ones, which is nice, because some of these feminists are really uh, hard to digest. Um, but this one actually, I find uh, to be pretty sympathetic to both genders. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit about her. So I'm gonna say three things. Uh, oh, um, you all have the book, right? Of uh, sharing the world, right? There's no problem getting that book, I think. Yeah, so Ram, you need to buy the book. Okay, great. All right, so three things I'm going to talk about. Number one, I'm going to talk about her life, which I know nothing about, to be honest, because she's not dead yet, and there's nothing out there on her. And the second point is feminism and womanism. And the third point, I'm going to talk about uh, the book, Sharing the World. Okay, so today we get like a, a brief introduction in feminist thought. You're going to get the whole chronology. I'm going to give you some authors if you want to go deeper. So this is kind of in a nutshell, feminism, feminist philosophy class. You can then go deeper and study some of these philosophers yourself. They're not hard to read, the feminists. They're just hard to digest. <laughs> All right, so she's born in 1932 in Belgium. And to be honest, I looked and looked for stuff on her, but I could barely find anything, which means I don't even know like if she's Italian, Belgian, or French, because she has an Italian name. She's written in Italian. She's written in French. She, she lived in France, so I know that much. So I'm going to go with Italian, living in Belgium, and moving to France. Irigaray Perez, hello. <laughs> Okay, good. So um, 
Good. She did a master's degree in philosophy, uh, and then eventually she did um, a doctorate in linguistics uh, in France, right? She studied in France. She moved to France actually in the 60s, so that was when she was in her 30s, right? And then um, nobody knows. <laughs> All I know is that today she's still, you know, affiliated, probably not teaching. She's probably in her late 80s uh, at the University of Liverpool in, in England, right? So, so and, and, you know, I would love to give you juicy details about her love life because she is a feminist philosopher talking about gender relations, right? But I don't know anything. I will give extra credit for the scoop. Like, I will give extra credit for anyone giving me some gossip on Irigaray. <laughs> that you find anything on her personal life that I can integrate in this introduction. Um, are we good? Anybody? Oh, you're all ready to find me <laughs> some good juicy gossip on Irig, right? Who she dated? Who were the men she was with? Anything, right? I don't know anything. I couldn't find anything. Um, okay, so she's clearly our first feminist philosopher. So I want to situate her within the movement. So I want to go through the history of the movement. There are actually three waves of feminism, right? So we're going to talk about all three, first wave, second wave, third wave. She's in the second, right? And then I'm going to open up a small section on womanism, which is new. Um, so we'll talk about that. So, okay, first wave, feminism. Let's talk about that a little bit. First wave actually always been there, right? You have women, nuns, right, writing in the 16th century, about women's equality, right? First wave is this, um, uh, 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 how do you call it? Uh, this, this revolt on the part of women to have been made subservient to the man, right? Through tradition, often religious tradition, right? So women are saying we are equals, right? We are not inferior, right? There has, a, there has been a history in philosophy as well as in religious traditions, which have interpreted women's difference as inferior, right? So first wave is the attempt to correct that. We are not inferior, we are equal. And this first wave, you can see it from the middle ages on, people are, women are talking about that. Uh, Kim, you have a question? Uh, Professor, I don't know if you were typing, but uh, we can't see your chat. I think you might've been typing somewhere else. Why can't you see? Because I'm typing to Ram, that's why. Okay, here we are. First wave, thank you, uh, Kim. All right, here I am. Oh, and I wrote everything to Ram. Okay, so number one, her life. Number two, thank you, feminism and womanism. And number three, the book, Sharing the World. This is the outline for today. Okay, I think that's the main thing. Good. All right, so first wave, make sure you write this down. This is the, the woman's reaction to centuries of, you know, um, being depicted as inferior, right? So you find this inferiority, by the way, we, we tend to blame religion for it, especially, you know, Judaism, Islam, Christianity. Um, the other religions, interestingly, don't have that so, so much, right? But actually, um, I would beg to differ, right? <laughs> if you go to the original text of these traditions, you have actually a lot on uh, women uh, as um, not only the equal, but sometimes as superior, <laughs> right? So the Hebrew Bible has texts which completely overturn patriarchy and show the woman as the redeemer of man instead of the woman as the downfall of man, right? You have the same in Christianity uh, in the original text and in Islam also, uh, at least stories surrounding the, the wives of the prophet, for instance. Oh, and by the way, footnote, <laughs> I'll make a quick ad break, right? Next semester, I am teaching a, a class. Um, it's called uh, Plato and the Bible, right? But what I'm going to be looking at is all of the uh, subversions of patriarchy in the Hebrew Bible, all of the texts, all of the books of the Bible, which were written in order to subvert patriarchy um, and, and to retell the story of the genders, right? So a lot of these books um, are giving a completely different vision of the woman than what patriarchy does 
which is the dominant culture of the Hebrew Bible. So yes, dominantly in the Hebrew Bible, woman is property, woman is, um, you know, bought and <laughs> married, <laughs> you know, passed on as property, doesn't have much say, right? But there are a number of subverting, uh, subversive texts and books, entire books in the Hebrew Bible that go against this view. Uh, and so in that class next semester, I'm gonna be exploring these uh, rebel texts, right? Uh, we're gonna be looking at um, the book of Esther, the Song of Songs, the book of Ruth, uh, some texts also written by, um, uh, which go against institutional religion, some texts which uh, go against even the Hebraic worldview. So we're gonna be looking at these rebel texts, right? Um, so yeah, so, so just to give you an idea that, you know, the subversion of patriarchy, even as ancient as the Bible, right? Okay, there's a couple questions. So Kim and Allegre, Kim and then Allegre. Sorry, I forgot to put my hand down. Okay, Allegre. Oh yeah, I'm, because I'm thinking, will you class will go over like mistranslations of like certain texts of the Bibles? Because there was, there's not a one-to-one -one, and there's also different versions. Yeah. So I'm also guessing you can also compare like, you know, King James version to like, to what it should be. And you could also compare like the actual like fundamental Christian, like fundamental evangelicals compared to like what they're supposed to be. Absolutely. I'm actually going to go into the original Hebrew and show how many of these texts on women have been not only misread in the Hebrew, but also misinterpreted, right? So um, I'm going to look mostly, one of the main texts we're going to do is the curse of woman at the moment when she ate the fruit, right? And she gave it to her husband. And then there's this whole interpretation of the woman as the temptress who causes the downfall of man. Actually, the original text not saying any of that, <laughs> saying something completely different. So we're going to be looking uh, beyond the misinterpretations of the church fathers, of the evangelical community, of even the Jewish rabbis to what I believe the text meant to say in its subversive voice, which has been over the centuries washed down, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, so we'll be doing absolutely going against some of these interpretations that are seen as standard. We'll be doing that. Um, so, I have just one more question. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Um, so, oh, fuck, what was I going to say? So, so I was going to ask then, why did they make this kind of trans mistranslations then? Um, well, I'm going to talk about it. Um, in the class, what is making them misread the text to that extent, right? I'm going to argue in the class, actually, that a lot of the interpreters of the Bible come from the Greek tradition and are reading the text with Greek eyes. And we know what the Greeks think of the women, <laughs> right? If you read a little bit of uh, Socrates, <laughs> you know already. Um, so this is, in my view, why a lot of people misread the Hebrew text, because they're reading with Greek eyes, starting with the church fathers, starting with a lot of rabbinic Judaism. They are bred in a Hellenistic Greek context, and they are misreading, in my view, the text because of their heavy Greek baggage. <laughs> and the Greeks had a very clear view that the woman is inferior, she is, you know, corrupt, and so forth, right? So this has gone into the interpretation, but it's not in the original text, which is what I'm going to be showing. Um, good, no, thank you. Now I was able to really <laughs> develop uh, what I'm going to be doing in that class. I'll talk more about it later in the semester. Just right at the end, I'll send you also something, but I wanted to make my case right now. So uh, where was I? Yeah, so first wave is, so we think it's the religious traditions, but like I was just saying to Allegre, the actual scripture is, is quite innocent of this. It's the interpretations that are problematic, and in, in the interpretations which are stemming from Aristotelian philosophy, right? So, uh, and it's so funny because Aristotle has a great um, <laughs> section on gender difference. And I'm gonna go into it briefly because Irigora is gonna mention it. Uh, so let's do a quick Aristotle um, uh, summary. So Aristotle, says something very interesting. He starts with a biology. Remember, he's also a natural scientist, right? So he starts with the biological differences. So make sure you guys are writing this down because this is going to come back. So he says, okay, and it's true. Women's bodies are cooler. Body temperature is lower. That's true. Male body, body temperature is higher. So far, so good. Now he begins. So difference in the body, but now begins the interpretation, 
right? Now he's going to explain what it means. And this is where he starts going downhill, in my view, right? So he says, okay, so because the woman's body is cooler, she has less spirit. She's less spirited. She's less energetic. And so even though she knows what is right and wrong, she doesn't have the enough energy to control herself. So it's not that the woman doesn't know what is right and wrong. She knows, intellectually she knows, but she is so sluggish and her body is so weak <laughs> that she cannot resist right, her, her emotions and her passions. And so she will more easily succumb to perversion and vice than the male who has more, mm, right? He's more, he's stronger, he's more energy, can control himself better. So that's the first thing he says, right? Um, so now basing, basically the woman is now actually morally inferior to the male because of her body, right? So um, the other thing he says is that the woman, because she's more sluggish and slow and so forth, uh, is also uh, better adapted to following, right? The male is more spirited, more energetic. He should lead, he says, right? He's more adapted physically to leadership positions because he has so much drive, right? The woman, on the other hand, because she's kind of weak and, you know, sluggish and sitting around, right? She's more, she's, she's a better follower. She does that better, right? So therefore, Aristotle says, the woman should surrender, submit to the man and the man should lead the woman, right? Because of their biological differences. And so obviously all kinds of things come out of that, meaning the woman cannot have a leadership position. This is a, a perversion of biology, <laughs> right? So political sphere, all male, obviously, right? Because this is all leadership, right? Uh, and at the home, even in the home, of course, she cannot have a leadership position either, right? So the man is the head of the woman in the home. And so she is really there to serve the man and, 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 and bring forth children, right? So, so this is this idea, these two ideas of the woman as morally degenerate or inferior and as of the woman as um, a follower or passive, you know, someone who should submit, you find this has infiltered the religions, right? And one of the things I'll do in the class next semester is show how the Aristotelian lens has completely perverted the view of gender in the Hebrew Bible, right? The, the rabbinic interpretations, the church fathers have all been reading texts about women with this idea that the woman should <laughs> submit to the man and that the woman is inferior morally. But actually, when you go in the Hebrew context, there is this, it doesn't exist. You have their women in leadership positions. You have women who are... Um, moral authorities and so you know, completely different even though it's a patriarchal culture right so even in the midst of patriarchy you don't have this right so so anyway so this idea right of the woman as inferior because of her body right she's inferior morally she's a, she has to submit um, to the man this you find it has permeated right the the not only the religion but the philosophy Right, you see this in philosophical works, right? Everybody in a way stemming from Aristotle, right? He was the original sin of <laughs> he committed the original sin of this view, right? So most of the women, right, who are responding are responding indirectly to Aristotle, saying, well, no, even right, and, and actually, so the first wave, what the first wave is gonna do is gonna say, well, no, we are not different. That's the main thing, right? First wave is gonna try to emphasize the fact that we are not different because they know that as soon as we become different, puff, we become inferior, right? So first wave, and maybe this was a mistake, but at least, you know, they, it was a, 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 a well-meant effort. They're going to argue, no, the woman is the same as the man. We have the same brain, Physically, maybe, but it doesn't matter. We are equal on 99% of everything, right? So because we're equal, now you cannot say we're inferior anymore, right? So here are some authors you can read who are arguing this. The, one of the, uh, in the 18th century, you have Wollstonecraft, who wrote her famous uh, a Vindication of the Rights of Women. This is around the time, right, where the women's movement starting to be born in the 18th century women want to be equal it's also the abolition of slavery right it's part of that we want to be equal right this is part of this general trend in society in the 18th century trying to equalize <laughs> equalize people between races and equalize between genders right 
Um, the more recent one, American one, is Betty Friedan, who wrote an interesting, the book title is interesting, Feminine Mystique. Basically, I read the book. Um, it's basically a housewife, right? Betty Friedan, she's, she's, she's a housewife who just couldn't stand her existence anymore because of the infinite boredom of living at home by <laughs> doing only house housework, right? So she's basically, the book is really a kind of pouring out of her frustration of being stuck at home, right? And this is part of this Aristotelian idea. The woman should be here, cannot go out because cannot leave, right? So cannot do anything um, because of, otherwise she will be ruling the man, <laughs> right? So, and then you have, of course, Simone de Beauvoir, right? In the French, um, who wrote a really excellent book called The Second Sex, um, where she really, in the book, really, uh, I mean, she is going into how unfortunate it is to be born a woman in our society, right? So she goes into all of the limitations that have been placed on women because they are women, right? So uh, it's actually a really depressing read. I, I had to stop. <laughs> I was going to be like, I was going to lose my joy. <laughs> so I had to stop in the middle. I couldn't finish it. Um, but it's, it's so accurate. It's just, it, it just, you can't, you gotta stop after a while. Cause it's like, you, you start to become infested <laughs> by this, this reality. Right. So in <laughs> ignorance is bliss. Um, so anyway, so, but yeah, but she's a, you know, if you really want to, you know, if you have more courage than me, definitely read the whole book. Okay, any questions on first wave? So you can go and read these texts, right? Um, these are interesting. Any questions so far? Okay. Now, second wave is the backlash, right? So I'm gonna write it down in the chat, right? Second wave. This is really now women are realizing that equality is not all that great. And here's why. If as a woman you want to enter the man's world, okay, now women can be doctors, teachers, they can be politicians and so forth, right? But because they have entered under the, the guise of equality, they have now to act and behave and dwell in the world like men, right? You wanted to be men? All right, here, take, <laughs> right? Don't you dare come now with a pregnancy. Don't you dare come now with your cycle, you know, you're feeling you don't wanna to go to work. Don't you dare, right? In other words, we were allowed to enter the world, right? Uh, the man's world, but by leaving behind our feminine body, right? Can't, can't bring in any of that, right? So in other words, if you really want to get that job, don't mention that you're, you know, two months pregnant, <laughs> right? Or don't get pregnant at all, right? If you want to get that position and so forth. So women realized that they were sacrificing more and more uh, aspects of themselves, essential aspects of themselves pertaining to their feminine body, right? So for example, I had a, a friend who, who told me she was studying medicine. This is just a very mild example. <laughs> she was studying medicine and to do medicine, you got to go all the way, right? Do up until the specialty. She would have been done around 33, 34 years old, right? And she was telling me, you know, this sucks because I just got married. She was 24 and we want to have kids, and this is the right time to have kids, right? This is when the female body is optimal at 33, 34. It's harder, but I have to postpone that and maybe never have it because I want so bad to be a medical doctor, right? So this is just one very mild example, right, of how a woman has to sacrifice an essential aspect of herself because she wants to dwell she is dwelling in a man's world still, right? So second wave actually is saying, we have to do two things to really reach equality, right? Number one, we have to embrace and celebrate our difference. Let's stop trying to be like men. Let's acknowledge that we are different, that we feel differently, we think differently, we have a different way of dwelling in the world. We are going to give you a different perspective, right? Let's, let's celebrate our difference rather than try to push it under the rug. And number two, if we're going to enter the world as women, space has to be made for us, right? The world has to be able to accommodate a woman's body, right? One example in which the world is slowly moving in that direction is the recent um, law that was passed in CUNY, right? That women could have parental leave, 
right? This was not the case. If, uh, if when I started teaching about 10 years ago, if you had a baby, you didn't have parental leave. So what you would do as a woman is organize your baby during your sabbatical, which normally you should be doing research, right? Publishing. The woman would not publish. She would get her baby out and do her baby thing, right? So again, penalized because you're not spending your sabbatical like you should be publishing. <laughs> you're taking care of your baby. But that was the only way for a woman to actually be able to fit, <laughs> squeeze her baby in her academic life, right? So one of the ways we're starting to um, move in the direction of making the world more hospitable to women is things like parental leave, things like um, free childcare, right? Things like this that we are recognizing if we want women to really be part of the world without sacrificing something essential about them, we have to change the world, the way the world operates, right? So that's the second wave, right? This is two things, right? The need to shift the way the world operates. And number two, the, 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 the importance as a woman to celebrate one's difference, right? So in this uh, 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 wave, right? In this uh, movement, you have people like uh, Helen Sixou, who is uh, fabulous. She, she wrote an interesting essay called The Laugh of the Medusa which I really encourage you to read. It's, it's, it's really very um, a playful essay on um, <laughs> how the woman has been feared when in fact she's quite vulnerable, right? And, and not a threat at all, but she, there's, there has been this kind of subconscious fear, right, of the woman. Uh, and so she writes about that in that essay. Um, also you have uh, Gilligan, and I forgot her first name, um, I think I have the book here. Let's see. Uh, oh, I can't see. Okay. Um, so Gilligan, the essay is in a different voice. This is really interesting if you are into ethics because the whole, she's more of a psychologist, but she shows in that essay how boys, she studies boys and girls, how they react to moral dilemma. And she shows that the girls are reasoning differently than the boys when it comes to a, a given moral dilemma and she's showing basically that it, based on her experimentation right so she's really observing thousands and thousands of cases based on that she deduces that women have a different moral sense than the men right women um proceed differently have a different moral reasoning than the men so she's showing actual cognitive differences right between the men and the woman uh, and then of course we have irigaray right she's part of this movement uh, and then, of course, what you should read, um, in addition, of course, to this book, is To Be Two, right? There she really emphasizes uh, what it means to be a woman um, and so forth. So, yeah, so we have um, second trend, right? Second wave, if you're interested as a woman to know more about what it means to be a woman, right? If as a man you want to hear more you want to understand more what is going on <laughs> in a woman's head, right? This is the place you want to go. These are the books you want to read. And then finally, you have third wave. Um, and this is, of course, the wave in the States, started in the United States, right? Uh, and this is the, the wave uh, really spearheaded by Judith Butler with her famous book, Gender Trouble, right? This is the wave now where you have a lot more so second wave was more, you know, women who were more heterosexual, first wave also, third wave, now you have kind of the whole spectrum is talking, right? All kinds of women. <laughs> and so their, their main issue is with the second wave, right? They're saying, wait a second, what are you talking about? What is woman and what is the woman's essence? Like, I don't fit into what you're saying, right? I, I don't feel like I, I have like a definite essence. I'm fluid, <laughs> right? So a lot of these women are, are, are going against this so-called woman's essence, right? Because they're saying, I don't fit into that, right? They're looking at the works of Sixu of Irigaray. They're looking at the works of um, Gilligan, right? And they're saying, well, me as, as a lesbian woman or as a, a trans woman, I don't feel like I fit into those categories. And in fact, I resent there being even any categories. Why should I fit into some category? I feel like I don't, 
I, I don't have it. I'm, I'm a mixture, right? And you'll see that. A lot of these women, Judith Butler, for example, is a perfect example, right? She's sensing both male and female, and, you know, moving within her. There is not, right, this, uh, it's not clear cut, right? Same with trans women, right? Who are struggling with, am I male, am I female? <laughs> you know, I don't feel like I'm either, right? Um, so this is the struggle in third wave, right? So yes, this is the, 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 the struggle against what is called what Allegra is talking about, which is essentialism, right? The idea that there is a specific feminine essence, right? Connected to a feminine body. And they're, they're saying, well, I have a feminine body, but my essence ain't feminine, <laughs> right? And I don't feel like, you know, girly. <laughs> so that's the issue. So she is basically saying, and she's very interesting to read. I, I, in the end, I, I have some trouble completely following her all the way, but she's actually arguing. And this is quite radical. She's not just saying that gender is a construct. She's actually going as far as to say that sexual difference is a construct, that we see differences in sex because we are conditioned by society to look for that and she's saying if we weren't conditioned we wouldn't even notice no, i don't know if i follow her all the way uh, definitely the idea that gender is a construct that you know woman is this man is this it's a, this is certainly a, a construct which can be dangerous i agree with her because if you say woman like aristotle he's constructing right he's saying woman is weak morally because of her weak body and she has to and then now comes a whole set of consequences right which i'm not comfortable with right so so this idea that gender is a construct that's clear everybody agrees but she goes further she takes a deeper step and says actual even sexual difference is a con the biological differences is a construct because we are conditioned to look for them right if we were not conditioned to look for them we might not even notice kind of like we don't notice if people have big ears or small ears big noses it's not a big deal right that's what she's looking so she's aiming at a genderless society where according to her, finally, there will be no more oppression because there is no more difference. Obviously, there's no more difference. There's no more conflict, <laughs> right? Uh, my question to Judith Butler would be, uh, so you're, you want to get rid of, uh, of conflict, but must you sacrifice difference for that, right? Is it really, uh, you know, the abolition of difference, is that really a victory? Right, that's what I would ask her. <laughs> um, but that's between me and her, and we're talking about the regret. Okay, so that's a third wave, right? Any questions so far before I get into womanism? Okay, Kim, go ahead. I'm sorry, just a quick question. So how would how did Ju how would Judith Butler account for phys like actual physical differences, like hormones and things like that? Yeah, she sees them, but she says, because we're conditioned to see them as important, we make a big deal. So she says, if we weren't conditioned to look for them, we would see sexual difference, like we see difference in eye color. Oh, you have blue eyes. Okay, whatever. That doesn't make you anything special or, you know, inferior, superior. Oh, you have blonde hair. So the same way that there's blue eyes, blonde hair, there can be male sex, female sex. It's, it's like small accidental differences, not essential differences, right? She's saying we've made a big deal out of this. Too big. Right? It's like making a big deal out of blue eyes and brown eyes. Oh, now we will separate society in brown eyed people, blue eyed people, and blue eyed people are like this and we'll oppress them. You see the issue? So she sees the difference, but she says we've made too much of a big deal out of it. That, does that make sense, uh, Kim? Yes, it does. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Good. All right. So now moving on into the last trend, which is womanism, which is, and to be honest, it's my favorite trend um, simply because there's a lot of connections between womanism and Hebrew thought. <laughs> so. Um, I, I actually appreciate it. Womanism is not coming from Hebrew thought, coming from African-American women, right? Uh, this is a, a reaction to feminism. And these are women who are saying like, okay, we also want to, you know, celebrate our femininity. We also want to move forward in society, but we don't want to take the same path as feminists. And the main reason is this. For, for, for many years, feminism has made the man the enemy. The man is the obstacle to getting ahead, right? This is really one of the issues that feminism is dealing with. It's like, okay, can you finally recognize I'm equal? Can you move over so I can squeeze in, right? Can you stop blocking my way to success, right? The man is the enemy, right? He's the one blocking. Now, when you're an African-American and you're dealing not only with sexism, but with uh, racism, 
you realize that the man, at least in your community, is not blocking you. He's in the same situation as you, <laughs> right? The man and the woman in the African-American community are both blocked <laughs> by, you know, what you would call white supremacy or, you know, these, these, uh, this, this, this kind of, you know, subconscious idea that we have that, you know, you have to be white to, to be effective, right, efficient. So she, they're noticing that the enemy, at least as far as they're concerned, is not the male. Right, the enemy is racism. The enemy is institutional, uh, institutionalized forms of oppression. Right, so they don't want to see the man as the enemy. They want to see the man as a partner. So their writing is actually much more man friendly. Right. So yes, Allegra, you have all the big words for me. Thank you. Intersectionality. Right. Absolutely. They are. They have two problems. Not only uh, being a woman, but being a black woman. Right. So the the problems intersect. That's what Allegra is talking about. Right. So. So they're writing actually much more man friendly, much more um, a cooperative, right? They see the man as, as, a, as a companion in uh, oppression, right? And, and, uh, but they also realize that the man, even in the African American community, has room to grow because that man, and this is, I think, one of the complaints of Bell Hooks, right? Who's writing um, from that, from within that community, that man is seeing the patriarchal chauvinistic ideal that is society's ideal and imitating it right so the ideal man in the black community is this powerful male right who is in the aristotelian male right which is the dominant male still in our civilization right so they're seeing that and they're emulating and so a lot of these women who are writing are often appealing to the black man and saying please do not fall for that trap, for that myth, right, of who man is, right? Man is, 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 is not necessarily looks like that, right? Does not necessarily look like that. So there's, uh, so Bell Hooks has written enormously uh, and, and her, uh, about that, right? And she is really, when you read her text, it's really kind of like a hand extended, right? Uh, or a plea uh, extended to the black male, right? To, to, to recreate a broken relationship between the black woman and the black man, right? The relationship has been broken. And most of her writing is an attempt to heal that relationship, right? Um, so that's an interesting one to read. You also have, of course, uh, Alice Walker, who coined the term um, womanism. And then, of course, Clenora. Hudson Weems, who's coming from the African context. So she's written a lot about womanism from the African perspective. And then of course, Audre Lorde, right? So these are some of the writers where you'll get this more partnership approach, um, appeal to the man to partner with a woman rather than, you know, uh, this kind of more aggressive stance, right? That feminists often have. Okay, so now I give you the whole panoramic view. <laughs> you have uh, the uh, uh, main idea of where, uh, and I really encourage you, read those books. They're, they're very interesting. They're some of my favorites. Um, and one day I would like maybe to teach a class that goes over all of these texts, right? And I think in that class I would add in womanism, Beyonce's Lemonade. <laughs> I think it belongs there. It's excellent. I don't know if you've seen it. Everybody, anybody seen Beyonce's Lemonade? Who has seen it? Put your hand in the screen. <laughs> okay, it's, uh, honestly, it's uh, seen, the music videos. Um, it's, it's a masterpiece. I have to say, I have to bow before her at that moment. <laughs> She's a pop star, but she did a good job there, right? It's a masterpiece of a woman challenging a man without breaking off with him. This is womanism, right? You challenge the man, but you don't dump him. <laughs> Even though she has a lot of songs about dumping, right? She, that particular uh, uh, work, she is really staying connected while challenging, right? Her husband, right? Of course, we know the story. So, okay, good. Let's get into sharing the world. Um, let's see. How much time do I have? Good, I have some time. Okay, all right. There's going to be three main things I'll talk about, or there are three main themes in sharing the world. Um, first of all, there's the, as the problem of essentialism, which I'll talk about right now. Then you have the notion of the problem of the universal subject. And then you have the problem of uh, sexual desire. 
okay, these are the three main uh, topics, uh, issues that you will stumble on in that book. So let's talk a little bit about essentialism in Irigaray and how she um, navigates it, right? So we know she's second wave. So she wants to go back to celebrating what makes a woman different, right? So she will be talking about, right? The way that the woman is different, feels differently, inhabits the world differently. But of course, instead of making this the woman inferior, she's going to say, well, this is why the woman completes the man, right? She's, she must be different so that she can offer a different perspective, which will complete the male perspective, right? So she's, she's, um, so she's talking about this difference as a, a, a resource, right? Not as something that is supposed to be feared or something that is supposed to lead to oppression. She sees it as a resource because for her, up until now, the male subject has dominated philosophy, science, politics, economy, and so forth. It's the male right? Most of the works written, most of the research throughout the centuries have been by males, right? So she's saying we have a strong male perspective, but we cannot find a complete view of what is medicine, what is science, what is the political, what is philosophy, if we don't have this second, right, uh, perspective, the, the female perspective, which completes it. So she's arguing basically that science as it is practiced today especially medicine has blind spots terrible blind spots why because most of the scientists are thinking along lines of the male subject right political the political realm horrible blind spots why not enough women right philosophy i won't even begin telling you how many blind spots <laughs> we have because there is no female philosophers, right, in the canon. We, finally, we have one right now that we're doing. After, uh, you know, 300 years, we've been going, you know, from Kant. So, so, right, so she's saying, you know, the reason why as a civilization, we are not progressing, but we are stuck and we are self-destructing is that we have not had this feminine perspective to balance things out. So this is interesting because you will find feminists who say, let's get rid of the males. They're all oppressors and tyranny. You know, they're all, you know, about dominating and destroying and exploiting. Let's get rid of the males and replace with females who will rule the world in a holistic way, right? So I've heard people like that, right? So she's not saying that. She's not, she's not saying that the male contribution is bad. Right? Of course, it's good. Everything the males have done for the most part is a lot of good, right? But she's saying because it's not in balance with the feminine perspective, it's too much. And therefore, we are reaching a state of imbalance, which is leading us to the chaos where we are today. Um, so that's an interesting perspective, which, by the way, is an Eastern perspective, which I'll talk about next time. Right in the East, you have this view of the, the important balance between the yin and the yang. She's drawing on that when she's talking like that. And so next class, when, when I see you again, I'll be developing a little bit more this theory of yin and yang so you can understand what she's basing this theory that we need balance between the male and the female, right? So we're going to talk about that later. But that's the first main thing, right? She's saying we need to recognize, we need to embrace our difference so we can bring our unique contribution. Kind of like Senghor, right? When he says, I need to embrace my blackness, right? This is the whole goal of negritude. I need to embrace my blackness so I can offer it to the nations and enrich the discourse. So she's saying the same thing. She's saying, I have to embrace my femininity so I can bring it to the table and enrich, right, the discourse and bring us closer to a civilized um, state of being. So, um, so yes, she falls into the category of saying women are X, women are Z, right? Women are this and that. But I think we need to, to remember that we have to see this as an exploration, right? Irigara is exploring, she's not decreeing, right? She's not making, you know, uh, how shall I put it? Universal principles. She's saying, you know, I'm exploring what it's like to be a woman in this particular body. And like uh, Siksu will say in one of her essays, right, this exploration must remain, right, and I think this is key, open-ended. 
and infinite. So she actually says that, right? We can't just stop and based on my experience as a woman, be like, okay, all women should be like this. No, right? It's about inhabiting the world and your specific body and what comes out of that, right? So you might be a trans woman, completely different way of inhabiting the world in your female body. So new perspective comes out of that. You can be a lesbian woman, again, completely different way of inhabiting the female body. So some other new perspective comes from that. So the idea is not to say all women are the same, is to say, let's go back to our body and honor the way that we dwell in the world, in our specific bodies, right? So, so it's an exploration, not a, a decree, right? She's saying, let's explore what it's like to be a woman. Let's stop, let's start to, um, you know, let's, let's, let's celebrate, let's explore, let's, let's never stop exploring, right? And as Siksu says, it has to be infinite and open-ended so as to not exclude certain women, right? All women need to be part of this uh, exploration, right? Not just heterosexual French women, like Rigori, right? There are many ways to be a woman. The idea is to sit and finally recognize, I have this body and therefore I'm going to enter or dwell in the world differently, feel differently, think differently because of my particular body, right? Um, so that's the idea. Um, so any questions about this first section on essentialism um, or objections or problems? There are many problems with essentialism, but uh, hopefully I've um, taken off a little bit some of the edge, but anyone has a question? Mm -hmm. Allegra? Um, I, like, I just want to go more nuanced, like, um, like what like in what many ways is to be a woman? Um, <clears throat> so we saw with intersectionality, right? You can be a black mm -hmm. woman. <laughs> so now you embody the world completely different than a white woman, right? Mm -hmm. it's, your body is, is a woman, but it's different type of woman than me because of different color, therefore different experience completely, right? Then you have Asian woman, you have trans woman, you have lesbian woman, you have, uh, so you have many different ways of being a woman. But the idea is, let's pay attention to our bodies. Let's not just try and fit into a, a generic human being, uh, you know, uh, label. Let's pay attention to our bodies and to the specific emotions and intelligence that arises out of that body. So I think she would acknowledge there are many ways of being a woman and we have to be inclusive in our discourse on what it is to be a woman. But we can't avoid talking about it, right? Let's not try and act like there's not such a thing as, as, as a female, right? That would be a lot, she's saying, right? We would be missing out on the, it's like if Sangor says, let's not talk about race anymore. Let's all be white. <laughs> You're losing, right? So if we all say, oh, let's just be a universal subject, which turns out to be male. We're losing, right, the, the, the specific gift of what it is to be a woman, right? So they're saying we must talk about it because we have a contribution, but let's try not talk about it in a way that, is, that excludes certain women. That's the idea. Is that mm. uh, a little bit? Uh, that, explains, no, that, that actually makes sense. That explains a lot more. Thank you. Good. Okay. Great. All right. So let's move on to the next point which is going to be, what, how did I put it <laughs> in the chat? The universal subject, right? So another issue she's going to talk about, which is interesting, is that at least in philosophy, we always talk about the subject. You noticed, right? With Kant, with Levinas, Buber, we, I've been talking myself, the subject, the human subject. And you recognize like, yeah, you mean the male subject, <laughs> right? And it's true. Right? If it is the male talking about the subject, he's going to project on that subject his, his way of inhabiting the world. Right? And so she is going to tell, she's going to say something very interesting. She's going to say subjectivity is too. Uh, and I'm spelling it out for you right now. Right? So she's actually going to say that in one of her texts. Subjectivity is not one. There's not one single human subject. There are two, the male and the female. Right? So she's, she's saying we need to stop thinking in terms of a universal subject, which actually is de, de facto a male subject. Right? She's saying let's open the door now to rethink the subject as um, two beings and not one. 
right? So in other words, what she's saying is to be human is not just to be male, it's also to be female. And once you put the two together, you have the human subject, right? So she's going to talk a lot about that. You're going to see that, right? This idea that we need to uh, recover the feminine that we have lost in centuries of philosophizing about the subject, right? It's always a subject which when you look at the features, it's predominantly male, right? So she's saying we need to start exploring the female side of the human subject or the female side of our humanity. And we need to bring the two together. And now we have a subject, right? So that's another thing she's gonna talk about, right? Um, the importance of broadening our categories to include the feminine. Because for so long, especially in philosophy, the categories have been male. The subject, the, you know, the will, the freedom. It's, it's all categories that belong to the male way of inhabiting the world, she would argue, right? She would say, we have a completely different cosmology, right? Our issues have nothing to do with reason, freedom, the will, uh, universal principles. She said, we don't care, <laughs> right? We don't care about freedom, the will, uh, universal principles. We have a totally different approach which has never been explored and which humanity is missing out on, right? So all of these questions that we study assiduously in philosophy, like freedom, the will, universal principles, the subject, um, social contract, the state, these are all actual male concerns, she says. <laughs> we women don't have these concerns. We haven't even begun to explore our own concerns, right? One of the main shifts she's making between the, or main differences she's making between the two cosmologies, between the two worlds, is what Levinas did, incidentally, when Levinas said, yeah, Aristotle says man is a rational animal, but I say man is a relational animal. This is exactly how Irigaray is going to separate the world, right? The male world sees things in terms of reason. The female world sees things in terms of relation, right? So Levinas in a way and Buber with their emphasis on the relationality of the subject are themselves male pioneers in the female world, right? So she's distinguishing, she's saying, yeah, it's okay to see things in terms of reason, in terms of subject object, in terms of how am I going to master the universe so I can be you know, strong and, and secure. Male concerns, she says, good, it's fine, please. I don't want to live in a cave next to a fire, shivering, right? <laughs> I want all of this technology, science, domination and so forth. But she's saying there's a whole other world we have never explored, which is the female world of relationality underexplored, pathetic. In fact, you look today at life and she makes that, that point. She says, we are so refined when it comes to technology. When, when it comes to the sexual relationship, we're like animals. We don't know anything. We don't understand anything. We're clueless. We're completely primitive, she says, right? So she's saying we need to begin to refine not only our technology, I mean, if you look at, you know, the iPhone, it's the, the, the art form, right? Pure refinement. She's saying we need to now turn to our relationships and apply the same degree of refinement to how we engage with each other. And she's going to go into the sexual relationship, right? She's going to explore that. So she's going to say we have not refined the way that we interact sexually with each other. We're still like the Cro-Magnon man. There's not much different, right? So that's what she's saying, right? We need to realize that there are two realms, right? And not just the rational matters, of course it matters, but also the relational. And we need to also begin to apply the same intelligence to the relational and the same refinement to the relationships that we have in the development, for example, of the iPhone, right? So that's the second thing you're going to see in her work. Any questions on that or comments? <clears throat> okay, good. Uh, the last thing is, I said it already, <laughs> the sexual desire, right? <clears throat> She's going to actually give us some, um, she would be great to use in like sex education, right? She has, um, especially her book, To Be Too, I, if you want to explore it. This is really, she talks about um, sexuality, 
but from a feminine perspective, right? Not feminist, feminine, right? She's talking about, you know, what does the woman truly need and desire? How can you connect as a man to a woman in a way that she can feel connected, right? And so she goes into great detail in, in the work to be too. And in sharing the world, she's going to be talking about, so it might be slightly offensive, which is why I'm going to bring balance to it, but she's going to be talking about the cultivation of male sexual energy. So we'll be talking about that in the first hour, right? First lecture. She talks about how in our society, there has not been given any attention to how to control one's sexual energy as a male or how to refine it. It's all the career, right? This is not taught. So she's going to spend the whole time talking about the need for that to happen. I will balance it out. <laughs> And talk about the need for the woman also to refine her sexual energy. And we're going to talk about that too, right? I'm not going to just make it a one-sided thing where the males get bashed about how uh, out of control they are and the females are the angels of glory, right? It's not true. <laughs> so I will add actually in that lecture, so as you're reading about the male and, and so forth, how you know the, our society has in a way not taught the male to refine their sexual energy, uh, be aware that I will then add an appendix where I talk about the woman, because we have also not been taught how to refine our sexual energy, which by the way, looks very different than the male. We'll talk about that. So we'll have kind of an advanced class in sex education. You should be expecting that in the next few, <laughs> in the next few days. We'll be really talking about the relationship you know, between genders, uh, the chaos that exists, and how we can refine that connection, right? So, uh, good. Um, <clears throat> that's the program. <laughs> Any questions? I can't believe there are no questions. This is so controversial material and everybody's sitting there. <laughs> I don't believe you that you don't have questions. <laughs> no? All right. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording.